Stephen, are you ready to do this? I am ready. All right, here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I'm very excited to have my guest today, Stephen Mills. Stephen, welcome. Thanks for having me, Guy. Great to be here. All right. So Stephen is the author of Chosen, a memoir of stolen boyhood, in which he recounts his childhood sexual abuse by a summer camp director, the long painful process of recovery, and his quest to stop a serial predator and find justice. The New York Times has called the book a searing, haunting, urgent creed de decor. The Pulitzer Prize winning novelist Juno Diaz says Chosen is a work of shattering, almost unbearable radiance. It's destined to be classic because this is a book that will save lives. Since 1983, Stephen has advised and written for an array of public interest organizations in the fields of human rights, civil liberties, and the environment. He's honored to serve as an ambassador for Child USA, the leading nonprofit fighting for the civil rights of children. Stephen, welcome. Thank you. So before we get going here, Stephen, um, share with the listeners where you are from originally and where you I'm are. originally from New York. Okay. Yeah. And currently, and where are you? Currently live in Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> I've covered the, both coasts. The obvious choice here. All right. <laughs> so let's, let's kind of jump in here. How the heck? Did, what's going on? How did you get here to write this book? Yeah, well, it, it was a long journey, guy. You know, it was these are things that happened more than half a century ago uh, when I was 13. And since I went into therapy in my late 20s, um, I mean, it took me that long. Like, like many male survivors of childhood sexual abuse, you know, we tend to numb the pain by all means possible. And that's something I get into in the book, you know, in terms of where my journey took me. And that was through, you know, drugs and acting out sexually and religion and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But male survivors tend to, uh, when all else fails, and that includes usually some suicide attempts, reach out in their usually 30s. But, but for me, through a series of rather dramatic circumstances, I found my way into therapy in my late 20s. And in, in the course of that, it became, I had the first inklings of wanting to tell this story, uh, but it was pretty incohate and I couldn't quite get my hands around it. Um, in 1987, uh, when I was, when I went to the FBI and the district attorney in Allegheny County in Pennsylvania to try to stop the perpetrator who abused, abused me and many, many other boys. Um, I met with an FBI agent toward the end of that whole journey through law enforcement who said, you know, you're a writer, you should really write about this because people need to know more about it, what the experience of kids is and the impact and, and the challenges, you know, mm -hmm. in getting perpetrators uh, brought to justice. And that sort of, that planted a seed. But then it took me... <laughs> The better part of 35 years to tell the story because honestly and i think any therapist can appreciate this you know i i had to really i had to go down through so many layers of um shame and guilt and there's these feelings of complicity i had and having been sexually assaulted at age 13 that it just took me that long you know mm -hmm. to peel all of that away and be ready to tell the story so in that took till 2018 that was the first attempt where i sat down and it just happened so at 13 this occurred in summer camp over the period of how long two years over a period of two yeah. years the grooming took place over one summer i mean like most uh, abusers this guy was in no hurry uh, you know, grooming, uh, you know, as opposed to what most most people's impression of grooming before sexual abuse is, oh, well, you know, giving the kids gifts or money or some boundary violations and all of that's true. But in fact, the emotional psychological grooming mm -hmm. is what's really at the core of it. And that takes place very gradually that's really a building of trust you know the perpetrator is building this bond of trust and dependence and that took all of a summer and then the following fall 
Uh, he conned my mother into letting him take me up to camp in the off season, where it's basically in the woods, a hundred miles from home, oh alone with him. That's where the sexual assault began, and that that repeated. Um, I never breathed a word of it, and that went on for a couple of years. Now, in the, I mean, there's so many things to to uh, address here, but in the wake of this, you know, you talked about managing shame and, and dealing with it in all the uh, different ways that you say you talk about in your book. In the wake of this, what did you think? What, how did you feel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I was so dissociated from what had happened to me. I knew that it had happened. I had no framework at 13 for understanding what it was what it was, I can tell you what it wasn't in my 13 year old brain. It wasn't about sex. It never occurred to me. In fact, it took another two years for it to occur to me that this guy got sexual pleasure from what he did to me. Mm -hmm. That was out of my, it just never uh, occurred to me. He was a married guy with a son, a respected professional. Um, it felt violent and, and, he was so dominant, physically large, dominant, scary. Um, so most of my experience of it was just pure terror. And, you know, for, for an adult, we hear child sexual abuse and we think sex. Mm -hmm. But for a kid, certainly for me, it was a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. In other words, the experience of being assaulted by someone twice your size. And again, this took me another 20 years till I was deep into therapy and actually with the help of taking MDMA, um, I came, I relived the experience and came to understand that it was a near death experience. I describe in the book at the moment of assault of being outside my body, I observed the whole episode um, from above looking down at the two of us as if I were watching it happen to someone else. Again, this is not uncommon, um, but my body, uh, as if you can imagine being attacked by a grizzly bear, you know, nature prepares you to die, right? By getting, you get this rush of endorphins mm -hmm. and uh, your front brain goes offline. I had no power of speech. I couldn't speak. Again, something I didn't understand till much later, why I couldn't say a word. So the experience was really one of going into shock. Uh, and I didn't, and that happened to greater or lesser extents for the next two years, although that, that tapered off. And at a certain mm -hmm. point, I understood that it was sexual from his point. But my framework for understanding it was really to the extent that I did. And um, I imagined, fantasized uh, that, he had taken me hostage as some kind of blackmail scheme and that if I breathed a word of it, he'd kill me and my family. And I just had no, I, you know, my mind was spinning with um, scenarios of mm -hmm. what this was and what it could be about. Uh, and and did this, yeah. how, how did this impact you socially and your family and school? Yeah, I went, I really, uh, I, interestingly, I was already a good student. I became an even better student, meaning, you know, my, I, my personality underwent an instantaneous change. I mean, I went from being a pretty sweet, trusting kid uh, to being um, hypervigilant, scared, reclusive, depressed, um, and, um, and I had no idea why. Again, I didn't make this connection consciously right. with what had happened to me. Uh, and my whole identity got wrapped up in uh, performing well in school. Um, that was seemed to me the only way to sort of redeem myself and be accepted and be okay. Um, but you know, beneath it all, I was really trying to disappear. So the fear of the fear of exposure, you know, the shame is so intense and the feeling of complicity 
uh, is so intense. And, and I say complicity because again, this is, this is an aspect of child sexual abuse that's poorly understood, I think, uh, partly because so few men write about it. There are so many great memoirs by women you know, that inspired me actually. Very few first person accounts by men. Uh, and, but one of the common features is the sense of complicity that happens at the moment of the sexual assault because mm -hmm. the perpetrator understands that the boy body is gonna respond sexually to any touch. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, you could, at the age 12, 13, right? You could be pawed by a wombat and you're gonna get an erection. That's what human physiology is, but that's the job of the body. Um, and the perpetrator uses that to say, hey, look, you want this, you know, you're inviting this. Um, and so that is deeply confusing and, and triggers a sense of, oh my God, I'm responsible for this. And every guy I know who has been through this is um, haunted by that feeling of complicity. And, and that takes a really, really long time uh, to look at and come to understand that no <laughs> I, right. I didn't want this and that was my body doing what nature prepares it to do but this was against my will uh, and um, this is sex without consent which is rape so this took place when you were 13 right um, cr crucial age uh what seventh grade eighth grade ninth grade yep um throughout high school do, do you cog cognitively consciously are you aware of what something happened are you more specific in your mind about what happened mm -hmm. yeah the uh i knew what had happened but um this is really, of course, the body protects us by shutting off the feelings associated with the assault, right? Because otherwise, you know, if I got up the next day and went to school, which I did, and was open to what had happened, I would have just been completely overwhelmed. But we were able to survive and move on because that's what we need to do and what nature prepares us to do. So, so the body, of course, this is a classic you know, trauma, um, the reality of trauma is, is the body keeps it from the conscious mind so that we can function. And I did function. Um, I, I functioned though, in kind of a zombie like state, uh, I was immediately aware in seventh grade, when I went back to school the next day, that I was outside my life in some way, not inside my life. In other words, there had been some break in reality. I couldn't, put words to it at the time, but it felt like I was watching my life um, from the outside and going through the motions without any kind of genuine, emo the kind of emotion I used to have about uh, being with, you know, playing with my friends and, and having, uh, you know, enjoyment through that and going to my clarinet lesson and liking it and all these daily things I did in seventh grade where suddenly I had this strange detachment from uh, and it would take a long, long time to reunite those two parts of myself. I mean, it would take really until I was able to access all of the, what it was that I shut away and compartmentalized um, in, in my body, which was the terror and the pain um, and the shame. Uh, and to, once I was able years later to lift the lid and let those out very slowly and see and feel what had happened. Um, then that zombie like feeling started to fade and I was back in my life again. But that that there was a long period where I wasn't right. right. At what point did you uh, seek help? And in what form did that come? And under what auspices was it? Yeah, it was, it was incredibly random. And again, you know, I would encourage people to read the book only to see how random these things can be because, um, and I think a lot of readers read it and say, whoa, you know, it's, it, you know, honestly, it's hard to read the book and not feel like the fact that I am here uh, and didn't manage to perish along the way, either at my own hands or in other ways is, is, um, 
it seems kind of improbable. And the way I got to, um, I, in my 20s, uh, what happened was I discovered that the guy who had abused me was, had moved to another state, was running another camp, and was abusing other boys. Now, I had always assumed I was the only one. It just never occurred to me that this could have happened to someone else. And by the way, later, when I tracked down other victims of the same abuser, they all said the same thing, virtually all of them. Oh, I was sure I was the only one. When I discovered that, one thing that happened uh, is I confronted him because I wanted to try to stop him. And if you read the book, you'll see what happened. That is very, very dramatic. Um, and, uh, but spoiler alert, he didn't stop and kept moving from camp to camp. At that point, I was still unable to go to law enforcement. And meanwhile, I had triggered all these, the dissociation I had lived with since age 13 started to collapse because now I knew what this guy was and what he was doing. It was right in front of my face. He was sexually abusing 13 year old boys. So I could no longer deny in my conscious mind what had happened to me. And what that did was with my denial starting to collapse, I went into this kind of spectacular meltdown. Uh, at, when that happened, uh, that I discovered that he was abusing boys, I was actually on my way to a PhD program in economics at the University of Wisconsin. And within three months, I dropped out of the program. I was shooting drugs. I was trying to take my own life. I just completely unraveled um, as I couldn't handle all the emotion that was just you know, coming at me from inside, all the trauma that was finally uh, had escaped Pandora's box, as it were. So that led to this four year, sort of the lost years of, of um, trying to disappear myself quite literally. And then I, I wound up in Southeast Asia in a refugee camp and I was so sick. I really had a complete physical mental breakdown. Went back to New York because I had no choice and um, thought I had some physical illness. Everything was ruled out. Uh, a friend's father who was a neurosurgeon finally said to me, you know, Stephen, I want you to see this psychiatrist. His name is Ken Greenspan and he's a pioneer of biofeedback. So this was 1981, 82. Um, I went to see Dr. Kenneth Greenspan who ran the, the stress-related uh, treatment center at, at Columbia Presbyterian in New York. Um, I mean, I didn't know a thing about him. I'd never heard of biofeedback. I went in, this is after 18 months of trying to get some diagnosis of what was wrong with my body. He listened to my story for 10 minutes and he said, I'm glad you saw all those doctors. It's good to rule out any underlying diagnosis, but I can tell you right now, you've got shell shock. I said, well, what do you mean? Isn't shell shock from being in a war? I've never been in a war. And he said, well, that may be, but you're sleeping in one. You know, something's getting mm -hmm. triggered during your sleep that is sending your mind into um, this cycle of terror and fear and um, really body, the body response, especially my gastrointestinal tract was very severe, which is what was causing all the symptoms. So that was sort of the beginning, you know, and I did a year with him, by the way, PTSD had just entered the diagnostic manual that year. And it wasn't, and even him, he was a big psychiatrist. He didn't use the term PTSD. And of course it would be many, many years before it entered the parlance of most therapists. Um, and this was New York, which was sort of ground zero for a lot of this stuff. Uh, they were still calling it shell shock. Uh, you know, from there, when he saw that at some point he realized that all of this went back to some childhood experience. He sent me to a psychotherapist who I started seeing twice a week uh, and uh, for many years. And in the midst of all that, and I still didn't tell this guy, I was probably in therapy for a year. I never mentioned the abuse, but then uh, my perpetrator emerged yet again in my mm -hmm. life. He had wormed his way into my family 
um, this goes back to the beginning of the story, but he was good friends with my mother and my stepfather, and they invited him to my older sister's wedding. Mm -hmm. And that triggered, you know, another episode of, of recognition. And that's when I really started dealing with it in, in therapy. Wow. Okay. <laughs> what point did you get to when you said, you know what, I've got to write not all, I mean, you're going through healing at some point, obviously, but what time, at what point did you say, I've got to write this book? Well, in, in 80, you know, once I, from say 83 to 80, 86, I was doing intensive, you know, what I'd call classical talking therapy around this. The following decades would, would, I would do many other types of therapy, mostly somatic. But at that point I was in talking therapy. And uh, I also, in the midst of that, met uh, a woman who would become my wife, who was the first, I had had many girlfriends and I'd never mentioned this um, experience of my childhood to any of them. I just never felt, it wasn't a conscious choice. It was just my body didn't feel safe doing that. And I didn't know how to talk about it. So uh, when I met Susan, um, she was the first who really got me to talk about it. And that, that was crucial, right. In having a, an open, trusting relationship. I'd never had that before. Um, I had therapy. I had, um, uh, then just randomly again, Susan and I happened to an ex-boyfriend of hers was a chemist at a famous cancer research Institute in New York. I won't name which one, but while they're doing cancer research, they were all also manufacturing ecstasy, MDMA. This was 1985. We started, uh, Susan and I, taking MDMA, not intentionally to explore my past, mm -hmm. but that's what came up pretty quickly. And through a series of, uh, of course, today, MDMA is being used in all sorts of clinical trials for exactly this, to mm -hmm. get at trauma and to be able to face trauma and process trauma. So we were somewhat pioneer, you know, sort of accidental pioneers of MDMA back in 1985. And it allowed me to retrace what had happened without any fear at all. And that was huge uh, because I got to witness and be with and process emotionally what had happened uh, the first time I was sexually assaulted. And, and that was a huge deal because it it allowed me to face it and accept that it had happened. Mm -hmm. And and in my experience, once you do that, it loses a lot of its power, uh, right? Because it's the fear that's driving all this stuff underground <clears throat> and kind of pulling the levers in your conscious day-to-day -day life. But if you can really look at what happened and be present with it and fully feel what you felt as a 13-year-old, then the grip starts to loosen. Um, and so, I mean, it's kind of paradoxical, right? I mean, you have sort of reliving it in a very intense way, but that was, that was a real gift. And that enabled me then to want to try to stop him and go to law enforcement. And that in turn led to this uh, realization that I needed to write about it. And- How old were um, you at this point, Stephen? At that point, I'm 30. Okay. Yeah, 30. So this is 17 years after it started. And, um, and the writing and the, you know, working with the trauma would go on. Well, the working with the trauma till today, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm in my mid 60s, I'm still working with it. It's a whole different thing now, of course, but it, it's one of the reasons I wanted to write this book now, and, and I'm glad that I waited. I used to beat myself up about not writing it in my 30s and 40s, but I couldn't have. I wasn't capable of doing it. And to me, part of the what's so um, significant about doing it now is that I have a much uh, wider, longer perspective on childhood trauma as a lifelong journey. And it really is lifelong. Um, and it's, I can see the arc of it 
much more clearly than I would have 20 years ago. You know, you can get stuck in certain phases of whether it's rage or, you know, guilt or whatever it is. But the longer and the further you go, you see that those are sort of stations along the way. What do therapists need to know? Yeah, I, I, I guess first and foremost, I think for therapists, I think I'd say first of all, the childhood experience, at least for mine and for many, many other, both men and women victims of childhood sexual assault, um, the, the sense of the experience as I was describing before as being in shock uh, or near death, um, that, um, that state of the body and of consciousness or of consciousness separating from the body, <clears throat> it, which I hear over and over again, is and the terror that comes along with it and can get triggered at any moment along throughout one's life and much less frequently for me these days, but it can still happen. The nervous system, um, and this is, uh, I'm not speaking technically here. This is just my, you know, my take as a non-expert. My nervous system got completely short-circuited that day, the first time I was assaulted. There would be many more times, but that first time something happened deep inside the nervous system um, that it went haywire. And after that, it's never going to be the same. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you can't go on and get, but one has to have and, and, and recover because I feel like I have come a long way toward recovery. But I think it's really important to honor the, um, profound damage to the nervous system that happens which lies at the heart of all this, right? In terms of our psyches and how we express it and feel it going through life. And, and, and by that, I mean, it's, there's an internal wisdom at work for, for each person in how to find their way to be with that and to heal from that. And every person's different, uh, but it is a really, really deep wound uh, in the, in the wiring of the body and the mind. And um, yeah, so I think to, of course, the other aspect of that is just the whole issue of completely losing agency and control over one's body. Um, this, the loss of uh, sort of forever associating the first feelings of sexual pleasure with having no say in the matter. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of sexuality, you know, that's just tremendously destructive, right? I mean, someone is taking your body hostage. Again, that's something very tough to walk back later. Mm -hmm. It's there forever. So um, anyway, these are a few of the things that I think, um, you know, for therapists, just to be cognizant that, um, respecting the depth of those things and working with those, in my experience, usually means building trust. And that can take a long, long time, you know, to build the, of course, trust is devastated when you're mm -hmm. assaulted as a child. I didn't trust anyone, again, for a long, long time. And to this day, I have, you know, real problems with right. You know, the sense of innocence or trust we might have in humans is, is really damaged. Uh, but someone, it's funny, someone at um, uh, a children's advocacy center, which, which are the centers in almost every city that work with child victims of sexual abuse, asked me, is there anything that could have gotten me to disclose at age 13, 14, or 15? This is a key question for people who work with kids because of course it's very tough to get um, boys and girls to talk, but especially boys. There's a scene in my book where an FBI agent says to me, boys who have been abused are tougher to crack than murderers. You know, you try all the tricks and they just don't break, right? That goes back to that shame 
and fear and sense of complicity. And she asked me, was there anything that would have gotten you to disclose at age 15? And I said, no, I, you, know, you could put a gun to my head uh, and I wouldn't have said a word because I, I thought I would have been killed by this guy. So I mentioned that because what it made me realize was when I did finally disclose in therapy, it was only after a very long period of building trust with this therapist. It wasn't like I walked in, sat down and said, mm -hmm. hey, let's talk about my childhood sexual right. abuse, right? And most therapists, of course, are quite familiar with this. It can take a long time for that to emerge. Um, and I mean, I have friends right now because since I wrote the book who are disclosing to me in their 60s who have never talked about it. Mm -hmm. So um, building, building a sense of trust in therapy, I think, way more important than going right at the issue. Even when the issue emerges, it's mm -hmm. still all about, uh, you know, from my point of view as the client, it was all about assessing, testing, watching the therapist to see if I could trust this guy, right? Because the, the body is still saying, do not disclose to anyone or you're gonna die. So, um, yeah. As we kind of wind down here, Stephen, what were some of the things that helped you that some therapists did? You know, I've, I've had all kinds of, um, apart from talking therapy, I did bioenergetics, Rosen method body work, um, somatic experiencing, uh, and sort of not things that you wouldn't necessarily call um, therapeutic per se, but sacred dance, um, obviously used psychedelics at various points. Um, you know, my, my approach has always been try anything and everything. Mm -hmm. And if it works, do more of it. Um, <laughs> so that's one lesson, right, is, and every person is different. So what works with one person may not work with another. EMDR may be great for one person, but zilch with someone else. Um, to me, sort of the guiding principle of what works and, and what has been most helpful in, in working with therapists is that anything that helps you get at the truth, you know, what feels real emotionally, in the body is a good thing and go there, you know, pursue that. Uh, and that may be somatic work. It may be talking. Um, it may be just moving the body. Um, so let me just interrupt you for a second. Yeah. So you're saying here that when you were working with therapists, when they were trying to get at the truth, mm -hmm. that was helping you. Yes. But as I said okay. before, it's not, you may not, you know, it's, it's rare that you can go directly at the truth. Like, right. tell me what happened or what you felt when blah, blah, blah. Right. So, because so much of this stuff, as we know much more clearly now than we did 30 years ago is encoded in the body and, and may not be visible or known by the conscious mind. How do you find, how do you find ways to access that in the body? Right. So talking therapy was fantastic for me in my early 30s, but I reached a certain point where it wasn't really revealing anymore. It got it got to a certain depth and no deeper. Mm -hmm. And after that, I began doing somatic therapies that let me actually start learning to feel what my body was holding and the emotions that were living in my body uh, and to release them. So that's, of course, therapists work in all sorts of different modes. And the reason I talk about truth is that I think the one in looking back at it, that's sort of the theme that tied together all the different modalities I've tried is that anything that worked was bringing me closer to the truth of my experience as a 13 year old. And that, that could be, um, like I said before, you know, it could be talking, it could be moving, it could be psychedelics, it could be, but anything that brought me in contact with the um, authentic experience was 
helpful. Awesome. All right, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Mills, the author of Chosen, a memoir of stolen boyhood. The book is out. Where can people get the book? Anywhere? Uh, everywhere. I mean, they can go to, I think you're going to drop my um, website, stephenmillsauthor.com, but it's a, there are buy buttons there for Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, independent bookstores. And actually, there's a fantastic Audible version. I got to say, I didn't read the book because there's so many characters and voices. I knew I couldn't do it. And <laughs> Mill and Audio got an amazing voice actor who, oh, wow. who did. I just listened to it and it, it really blew me away. I was like, whoa, this is an amazing story. <laughs> well, look, I, I really thank you for coming on here. For, to me, it's friggin' courageous to write the book, to go through what you did and to come on a podcast. And uh, we need more courageous people like you to, to stand up and, and share their experience and their strength. It's awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Guy. It's really right, an honor. Steven. Take care. Yeah, be well. <laughs>